Journey with me back to the time of Pythagoras, the ancient Greek philosopher who lived in the fifth century BCE and established a philosophical school in what is now Southern Italy. And maybe you've heard something about, I know, a theorem and maybe some triangles. We'll get to those. The Pythagoreans, his followers, believed that the harmony of the universe meant that everything from the movement of the planets to music relied on ratios of whole numbers. And they didn't look kindly on anyone who disagreed with them. But were they right? Now think carefully about your answer because it could mean death. G'day, I'm James Tanton, and this is Study Hall Algebra presented by Arizona State University and Crash Course. Now, over 2,000 years later, it is safe to say that there are numbers that can't be written as fractions. But for the Pythagoreans, something like the square root of two was so hard to write down, it created turmoil within their ranks. It's actually what we call an irrational number, or a number that can't be written as a ratio of whole numbers. Irrational numbers sound unnatural, but they can actually be found all around us in the simplest shapes. Circles, for instance, contain the famous irrational number pi. And the square root of two can be found in, well, you guessed it, a square. In fact, the whole concept of squaring a number or multiplying a number by itself comes from actual squares. If I draw a square with side length five, my area will be 25. Same with the side length of x. We get an area of x squared. Or we can do this in reverse. If you have a square with an area of nine, its side length must be three. Finding the side length is actually finding the square root, or a number we can multiply by itself to get the number we started with. And cubes work the same way. Just think about volumes instead of area. A cube with side length of two has a volume of two times two times two, or eight cubic units. The cube root of a number is the number you can multiply by itself three times to get what you started with. Now we can't easily visualize dimensions after three, so we don't have a special term for fourth roots or fifth roots or anything after cubes. But the nth root of a number is always a number you can multiply by itself n times to get your original number. In algebra, roots can make expressions look complicated. But the Pythagoreans, though iffy on their rational numbers, can help us simplify roots with their ideas on triangles. Actually, several cultures discovered what we now call the Pythagorean theorem long before Pythagoras. But historical biases aside, we can still use it to explore some truths about roots. Visually, we can take a right triangle and attach squares to each side. From the theorem, we know that the areas of the two smaller squares add up to the area of the large square. So if the two small squares have areas P and Q, then the large square is area P plus Q. The side lengths of these squares are then the square root of P and the square root of Q and the square root of P plus Q. And here, walking along the square root of P and then the square root of Q is clearly a longer path than walking along the square root of P plus Q. What does this have to do with roots? Well, it's tempting to try to combine different square roots with addition, but we can see it just doesn't work. If we plug in numbers to our picture, like nine and 16, we see the square root of nine plus 16 does not equal the square root of nine plus the square root of 16. But here's the thing, square roots and multiplication do get along well. The square root of A times the square root of B does equal the square root of A times B. We can run a quick mental check on this in several ways by substituting in real numbers, or by formally squaring both sides and seeing that they both, when squared, lead to a times b. So in algebra, we might see a radical expression or an algebraic expression with roots, like three plus the square root of 25 x squared equals 12. Now, after we subtract three from both sides, it might seem like there's nothing left to do, but actually we can rewrite this as the square root of 25 times the square root of x squared equals nine. And from there, we can actually solve for x, by dividing both sides by the square root of 25, we get x equals nine over the square root of 25. That is x equals nine over five. Now, so far, it might seem like that every number has an easy to find square root. So what about that square root of two? What was causing those Pythagoreans so much distress? To explain, let's draw some more squares. Here's the square of area one, and here's one of area four. Somewhere in between, there just has to be a square of area two. So what's the side length of the square of area two? We know it can't be one, one squared is one. And we know it can't be two because two squared is four. So it has to be a length somewhere between one and two. But where? 1.5 is too big. 1.4 is too small. Type the square root of two into a calculator and it shows something like 1.414213562, but even that's not quite right. Here's an even closer approximation to the square root of two. Square that and we still don't get exactly two. Although sometimes decimal approximations, numbers written in decimal form that are almost correct, are good enough for practical purposes. For example, if we're building a square bookcase and use 1.414 meters as our side length, we'll only be a tiny bit off from the area being two square meters. No one will be able to tell. But if we're building a resupply vessel to the International Space Station, or doing something else important like algebra homework, 99.97% accuracy just isn't good enough. Writing x equals the square root of two is 100% correct, but any decimal approximation is just that, something close, but not the true value. So each decimal place we add gets us closer to the real square root of two. But at some point we have to wonder if we're on a wild goose chase. Now thinking visually, 
and using geometry, the study of shapes and their properties, will help us out. If we cut the square with area one, called the unit square, in half diagonally, we get two triangles each with area one half. Then if we use that diagonal to create a new square, its area will be four times a half, which is two. So we know that a square with area two actually exists. It's right there in front of us. The square root of two must also exist. Maybe we just didn't go far enough. Or the decimal expansion of the square root of two really goes on forever. This isn't a totally ridiculous idea, since other numbers we're already familiar with, like a fraction one third, is written 0.33333333 forever. But wait, you say, something just doesn't feel right. One third is clearly a fraction, and irrational numbers can't be written as fractions. Well spotted. It turns out not all infinite decimals are irrational numbers but all irrational numbers are infinite decimals. So let's take a quick tangent and see how we can decide if an infinite decimal is secretly a fraction. Start with our decimal and give it a name like D for decimal. Now 0.3333 forever is really 3 tenths plus 3 hundredths plus 3 thousandths and so on. And we're calling it D. Multiply both sides by 10 to keep the equation balanced. And now the fractions on the right side actually form another D. And to simplify, we can subtract a D from both sides, which leaves us with the equivalent equation 9D equals three. So indeed, d must be one third. Any decimal that has a repeating pattern must match a fraction. And this technique explains why. If the decimal doesn't repeat, no matter how many times we multiply by 10, which basically just shifts the decimal place one place to the left, we'll never get the exact same sequence of fractions on the right side. So we'll never get a d on both sides. We won't be able to simplify the equation, and the trick fails. So does the decimal expansion of the square root of two ever repeat? We haven't seen a repeating pattern, but what about after a billion digits or a quadrillion digits? To answer that, we must face down death. Better put on our math goggles. It's ancient Greece, and we're at sea, feeling the wind in our hair and the spray on our cheeks. And the Pythagorean student Hippasus is about to meet his end. Well, allegedly. Legend has it that Hippasus created chaos, not by just saying, but proving the square root of two just isn't a fraction. Now maybe the Pythagoreans threw him overboard for questioning their teachings, or maybe the gods were punishing him for mathematical blasphemy. But either way, Let's see the truth for ourselves. Suppose I think that the square root of two actually is a fraction, like 99 seventieths. Can we prove I'm wrong? Take your fraction, let's use 99 over 70, and make sure it has the smallest possible numerator and denominator. Now draw a right triangle, or a triangle with a 90 degree angle, with two sides of length 70 and a diagonal of length 99. With the Pythagorean theorem, we can see the diagonal equals square root of 70 squared plus 70 squared, which is 70 times the square root of two, so 99 seventieths is indeed working as our square root of two. Fold it, and we get another right triangle. If we work out the side lengths, we get a smaller right triangle with side lengths of 29, 29, and 41. But let's use the Pythagorean theorem again. The diagonal of the small triangle equals the square root of 29 squared plus 29 squared, which equals 29 times the square root of two. So now the square root of two equals 41 over 29. Ah, so math is broken. We claim 99 over 70 was the fraction with the smallest possible numerator and denominator for the square root of two, but we just found a fraction with a smaller numerator and a smaller denominator. And these two fractions aren't even equivalent. To get out of this pickle, we must conclude this. Assuming the square root of two is a fraction is just plain wrong. And if it's not a fraction, it has to be irrational. Whoa, phew, we're still alive. So we've just seen it for ourselves. The square root of two is an irrational number and its decimal expansion will never repeat. So now we know there's a whole category of numbers beyond the integers and the fractions. This idea does feel irrational and mysterious, but we've just proved it. And now we can solve all sorts of equations that were close to us before, like x squared equals two, or x to the fifth minus two x plus three equals three. And that's what algebra does. It keeps opening up the possibilities of what we can describe in the language of math. Now, when working with roots, don't let them hold you back. If you're trying to simplify, remember you can't add or subtract to get rid of them or combine square roots but you can multiply and divide them. Remember that any answer your calculator gives for an international number is just an approximation. The true value exists, but we mortals just can't write it down with pencil and paper. Next time, we'll look at exponents and all the messes they create. Until then, cheers. Thanks for watching Study Hall Algebra, which is produced by Arizona State University and the Crash Course team at Complexly. If you like this video and want to keep learning with us here at Study Hall, be sure to subscribe. You can learn about ASU and all the videos produced by Crash Course in the links in the description. See you next time.